Hello everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Rajmal, uh, clinical pharmacist from uh, UAE Ministry Hospital. Today I am going to discuss about uh, antibiotic stewardship uh, in a tertiary care hospital. Uh, I will give a picture how we are conducting antibiotic stewardship in our hospital. As we all know that antibiotic stewardship is nothing but this is a set of strategies or of policies that helps to uh, like in, improve the usage of antibiotic in the hospital to treat the patient uh, and also reduce the development of resistant bugs, resistant bacteria, especially for uh, healthcare associated infections and all, and also reduce the financial burden over the patient. Uh, overall, it's a policies and procedure that is governed by a antibiotic stewardship committee. So I will tell you how we are doing this uh, in our center. So we can go through what are the objectives of this guideline. Uh, uh, we mainly focus uh, antibiotic usage in surgical prophylaxis. Uh, the reason is our hospital is a trauma care hospital. We have many surgery departments here. Uh, not only surgery departments, we have ICUs, we have general medicine departments, uh, all the pediatric departments, all other departments also available. Uh, in, But since uh, the number of surgeries per month or number of surgeries per year, it is high compared to other hospitals. So we are mainly focusing surgical prophylaxis. And the coming objectives, that is not only applicable for surgery patients, that is applicable for all the patients in the hospital. Uh, that includes improve the clinical outcome, reduce the adverse eff effects, uh, reduce the risk of uh, developing adverse effects and also maintain the effectiveness of antibiotic. Next important thing is antibiotic resistance. To reduce the risk of developing uh, res resistant bacteria, uh, that is one of our major challenge any, any healthcare provider facing nowadays. And also we have to reduce the chance of developing secondary infection, super infections. Uh, we know that after using broad spectrum antibiotics such as clindamycin or some fluoroquinolones, all these also third generation cephalosporins, all these may lead to development of Clostridium difficile infection. Uh, that is one of the major challenge any physician facing nowadays because it is a fatal infection. Also, we have to reduce the risk of developing toxicity by using antibiotic. The last thing is that it is for the patient, not only for the patient, it is for the uh, hospital also to reduce the unnecessary treatment cost uh, to reduce the financial burden over the patient. Now I will tell you how is the uh, multidisciplinary committee formed, uh, what are the members, who is the members of this committee. Uh, here we have a uh, the leader of this committee is a clini clinician who is a physician uh, uh, who is interested in this kind of activities, uh, who is su really supportive to the stewardship work. So here in our hospital we have a general surgeon. Uh, he is really supportive and he is really uh, interested in all these kind of activities. Then uh, the next important role is for clinical pharmacist or an inpatient pharmacist. As a pharmacy leader, uh, we we are playing we are playing a coordinator role in this committee. We have to we uh, the respon our responsibility include uh, conducting the meetings, uh, implementing the guidelines, monitoring mo monitoring the guidelines how uh, how these guidelines are follow followed by the healthcare pro providers and also uh, auditing conducting the audit work. Next, we have a infection control practi practitioner that is a physician. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure all the all the hospital having this uh, this position, but uh, this uh, infection control physician really helpful for these kind of activities. Uh, also, always a clinical pharmacist should work uh, collaboratively with uh, infection control physician. And next, we have a microbiologist. Uh, we know that we are sending all the culture samples to the lab and the microbiologist who is a physician, he is analyzing the sample and he is providing us with the uh, proper lab report, culture and sensitivity report, uh, the sensitivity of uh, antibiotics and also breakpoints, uh, minimum inhibitory concentration. All these help the physician and the clinical pharmacist and the healthcare team to take a decision regarding the choice of antibiotic. And also we have to include a uh, head of each department or a clinician from each major department from the hospital. And the uh, last one is, uh, and but, but not uh, least important, it is also very important, that is infection control nurse and a ward nurse. These nurses 
have major role because these infection control nurse they are managing uh, to prevent the healthcare associated infections uh, and also hand hygiene all these are very crucial for uh, antibiotic stewardship also Uh, as I already told you, uh, we are mainly focusing uh, surgical prophylaxis, antibiotic surgical prophylaxis, because our hospital is a trauma care hospital. So the thing is that it is based on the volume of surgeries, number of surgeries happening in our hospital each year, especially we calculated in 2018 and 2019, and also the risk of developing bacterial resistance uh, post-operatively uh, after treating with uh, uh, improper treatment with antibiotics and also we considered the cost of treatment uh, for the hospital how much uh, for, for the patient how much they are spending for the treatment mainly these three things we considered and we we started mainly focusing on the surgical prophylaxis and we first first, first thing was, was uh, we implemented a recommendations based on international guidelines we followed CDC uh, IDSA and also SHEA guidelines. All these guidelines, based on these guidelines, we prepared a, uh, our hospital-specific antibiotic protocol that is for surgical, especially for surgical prophylaxis. Uh, I will show you uh, how is this guideline we prepared. I'm not including all the data or all the uh, antibiotic, all the surgeries. I'm just showing how it is made. We give the recommendation for antibiotic selection to the physician uh, based on the uh, like based on the department or based on the type of surgery for an example for an example here you can see for uh, must accept mastectomy mastectomy as a first line agent we are recommending uh, first column uh, the second column that is the first line first line agent uh, we are recommending cefazolin or uh, if it is not available or if the patients cannot take cefazolin we are recommending uh, cefiroxin that is a second line agent second uh, choice for the physician if both are not uh, possible like if the patient is having a uh, penicillin allergy uh, he cannot take a penicillin or a cephalosporin in that case uh, we are recommending you can see the fourth column we are recommending another antibiotic that is clindamycin for this case such in such a way uh, based on the type of surgery we are recommending different antibiotic as a first line agent uh, or a second line agent or in case of penicillin allergy there is a long list of this guideline or recommendation. I am not including all of these. In this way, we help the physician to follow the proper international guideline uh, for selecting the antibiotic as a surgical prophylaxis. There are many surgeries that do not need antibiotic at all. In, in that case, a uh, physician has to avoid uh, giving antibiotic to the patient. That is also the uh, responsibility of the doctor. But uh, you uh, you never think that we are always uh, like preventing the doctor from prescribing something. No, it is not like that. Actually, uh, I will tell you an example. If the patient is coming with a, uh, abdominal pain and there is a diagnosis with acute appendicitis, most of the time the appendicitis will be infected. Uh, in that case, we will not uh, interrupt the uh, doctor's choice of giving an antibiotic. Uh, or for an example, if the patient is having a foreign body inside, and also uh, during the surgery, the surgery is very contaminated or a dirty surgery. In that all, all these cases we consider as a treatment, not a prophylaxis. So we will not never hold the physician hand or we will not restrict them the, for prescribing antibiotic. Brain body inside or, or the sur surgery after the surgery, that, or during the surgery, the surgery will be very uh, dirty or contaminated surgery. In that case also, it can be considered as, as a treatment, not a prophylaxis. So in that case, we will not uh, prevent the doctor from uh, prescribing antibiotic. As we already discussed, uh, we have some certain we have put certain inclusion and exclusion criteria for this uh, guideline. Uh, we recommend the physician to follow these recommendations of antibiotic for only uh, for those uh, patients more than one month of age uh, who is admitted for a surgical procedure and also uh, based on the surgery, type of surgery. Basically, we can classify each surgery uh, as a clean surgery uh, or a clean contaminated surgery or a uh, contaminated surgery and a dirty surgery. These four types we can classify. Uh, 
only after the physician will decide after completing the surgery he will decide whether it is a clean or clean contaminated or a contaminated or a dirty surgery and we include only clean surgeries and clean contaminated surgeries for our stewardship and uh, and we exclude contaminated procedures and uh, uh, dirty procedures uh, both of these uh, required treatment uh, not as a prophylaxis it required antibiotic treatment and also we exclude uh, patients less than 1 month of age so now i will tell you how this process happens how the patient receive the antibiotic for a surgeric prophylaxis surgical prophylaxis i will tell you the algorithm uh, first uh, first step is like surgeon place the order for antibiotic and uh, if it is a emergency emergency case the nurse can take the antibiotic from the operation theater floor stroke there is a floor stroke we uh, kept uh, from pharmacy department uh, in the operation theater that is for reducing the time delay Uh, so an anesthesia technician under the supervision of an anesthetist or a nurse can administer this antibiotic uh, that is based on our protocol if it is not a uh, like uh, it is a planned procedure it is not a uh, if it is not a emergency case so in that case the ward nurse can follow the me medicine uh, like there is a procedure to collect the medicine any any medication from the pharmacy in that case she can order the uh, she can take the medicine from the pharmacy and as usual she, she can administer uh, based on the time limit we recommended so the most important person uh, in this process is physician he is the decision maker uh, he is the one who prescribe the antibiotic so based on guideline we follow uh, start smart and then focus rule that rule is applicable for uh, mainly for physician so first thing is start smart uh, that contains antibiotic must be only prescribed when there is a proven or clinical suspicion of infection that means uh, only if there is a need of antibiotic Uh, there should be uh, in that case only the physician should uh, start the antibiotic also the physician has to take the uh, send the diagnostic test lab test and also cultures before uh, the start of uh, first dose of antibiotic but uh, in any case if it if it is a emergency or if the patient is deteriorating uh, it should, uh, the start of antibiotic should not be delayed for this uh, taking cultures for taking samples and all and the next thing is the antibiotic chosen should be a narrow spectrum as pos as much as possible because if a narrow spectrum antibiotic uh, covers the specified uh, suspected infection uh, the doctor should not go for a higher end uh, broad spectrum one and also the doctor has to follow the international or national or hospital in hospital in house guidelines for when selecting an antibiotic that means our uh, stewardship uh, our stewardship committee recommended guideline and while selecting an agent the agent should be correct agent uh, correct dose correct frequency correct duration and also the administration also should be and also physician should consider uh, monotherapy whenever appropriate uh, he should consider only single antibiotic for the infection uh, that is actually based on the severity of the infection he should not go for a multiple anti antibiotic uh, unnecessarily the start of antibiotic should be logical uh, it should be smart same time he should not uh, uh, hesitate to start and antibi proper antibiotic multiple antibiotic for a uh, genuine case uh, for a uh, like in case of a patient is going for a septic shock in that case physician cannot uh, wait for a culture report or a lab report so he can start with uh, both uh, gram negative coverage gram positive coverage even if it is required even he can start with empirical uh, and fungal coverage also Uh, surviving sepsis campaign guideline says that if there is a delay in one hour of starting a proper antibiotic for a septic shock patient th that increases the mortality rate by 7.5 percentage uh, so we are not going to stop the physician from prescribing a proper antibiotic for a genuine uh, infected patient it's not for uh, interrupting the doctor's decision making process uh, it, it is not like that so there there should not be any interruption uh, for starting an antibiotic for a uh, required patient for a infected patient so the next important step is focus focus means follow up uh, already we have started the physician have started a proper antibiotic for the patient and uh, he has to follow up the case every day we know that 
the culture report we already sent it will be available after 48 hours or sometimes 3 days or 4 days and the physician will take after getting this culture report he will take a decision on the current antibiotic not only based on the culture report he has to consider the inflammatory markers such as procalcitonin uh, crp also blood counts uh, status of fever all these parameters he has to consider and the doctor will take a decision on the current antibiotic if the patient is clinically stable he will think about stopping the antibiotic maybe he will switch from intravenous to oral or he will come from a broad spectrum to a na narrow spectrum or he will come from a uh, multiple antibiotic to a monotherapy uh, also if the patient is deteriorating uh, the physician will uh, go for a higher end antibiotic he will start a second an second antibiotic also all these all these are possible Now I will tell you what are the role of other healthcare providers uh, in this stewardship. The most important thing is for clinical pharmacists, uh, they will we will review the antibiotic order that is adherence to the guidelines and also adherence to our antibiotic stewardship policy, and also we will provide timely feedback uh, to the clinician uh, as appropriate. Next is a uh, microbiologist and a laboratory staff. Uh, they will provide advice on pro proper use of uh, the test and also they will provide the culture report and uh, they will provide timely feedback and advice to the physician as appropriate. Also, they will help us uh, developing the antibiogram. And the infection control nurse or infection control practitioner, they will provide uh, data regarding the surgical site infection in the hospital and the uh, development of multi-drug resistance bacteria throughout the hospital. And this data will be very helpful for us for uh, analyzing our policies and procedures, uh, how it is working. And already before we told that uh, the nurses or anesthesia technician, they will be uh, administering the medic medication. They will be collecting the medication from the floor stock or from the pharmacy and they will be administering the medication based on our guideline uh, to the patient, based on the physician order. Uh, so the next is the uh, role of patients and the family. Uh, it includes the provide the proper medical history, medication history, his details of drug allergy and all and also uh, take help the physician to uh, take proper uh, decision over their health. And the next important thing is uh, monitoring the uh, clinical practice guideline. Uh, after implementing any guideline, we have to monitor whether it is properly practicing by the physician and other healthcare prof professionals. So there should be some auditing, auditing for the uh, stewardship. And uh, we are using two methods, like we have a audit tool and key performance indicators. Auditing tool is uh, nothing but it's a uh, it is like a data collection form. Uh, the clinical pharmacist will do the auditing for each patients who undergone surgery, and uh, it contains patient patient uh, patient specific initial patient type of surgery, antibiotic prescribed, and the dose of antibiotic frequency, route of administration, and uh, indication duration, and uh, length of stay in the hospital, and uh, and uh, three most important things uh, other than this patient basic details we will collect that is coming in the next slide. So uh, three most important things uh, we are monitoring for surgical prophylaxis uh, is uh, that we call it as key performance indicators. The first one is key performance indicators for appropriate selection of prophylactic antibiotic. As we know we already prepared a proper guideline based on international recommendations and we have provided to the all the doctors all the surgeons and we are monitoring uh, the selection of antibiotic for the patient based on this guideline if it is uh, complying with the, our guideline and uh, the second one is a uh, key performance indicator for appropriate uh, prophylactic antibiotic timing that means administration of antibiotic uh, the recommended timing uh, of administration for any prophylactic antibiotic is one hour uh, before the starting of uh, surgery that is for uh, in the case of if the antibiotic is given as a iv bolus or iv short infusion only if the antibiotics like uh, ciprofloxacin or vancomycin uh, all these antibiotics has to be given uh, as a long prolonged infusion 
in such cases we can consider as uh, within two hour before the start of surgery that means the uh, appropriate timing means uh, it should be before one hour or in special cases it should be before uh, within two hours of uh, start of surgery and the third key performance indicator is for appropriate uh, duration of antibiotic we are monitoring uh, how long the physician continue the antibiotic uh, if the uh, case is if the surgery is uh, not an infected surgery if it is a uh, clean or clean contaminated surgery the physician can continue up to uh, after surgery he can continue up to for 24 hours and if the patient is not having any signs of infection he must stop the antibiotic after uh, before 24 hours uh, it does not say that he has to uh, it is not mandatory to continue uh, he has to continue the antibiotic for 24 hours he can stop with the one dose uh, pre preoperative dose only uh, the maximum duration he can continue is 24 hours if there is no sense of infection so as we discussed uh, we are monitoring the three main kpis and uh, we are having the data uh, how the antibiotic selection how is the antibiotic administration and how is the antibiotic duration and uh, uh, if we observe any uh, decrease in the adherence to the antibiotic selection we made an action plan uh, that contains uh, clinical pharmacists have to contact the ordering physician if there is any deviation from our uh, ASB guideline and also we have to provide uh, feedback intervention to uh, selected departments and also flashcard the reminders uh, like an email or uh, like WhatsApp or phone, call, phone calls we can remind the physician regarding our guideline and also we prepared a summary of uh, the all the antibiotic uh, recommendation for surgery, surgical prophylaxis and we provided it is in each nursing station and each ward and uh, even in the operation theater we provide and also uh, here in our hospital we are using a uh, fully online system for ordering anything it, or, totally online system we are using so we made a default prophylactic order for uh, pre-operative antibiotic so the physician if the physician choose the pre-operative order it will be automatically the system will stop after 24 hours of uh, first dose and uh, if there is any uh, deviation from the appropriate administration time uh, we remind the anesthetist or the OT nurse uh, who are responsible for uh, administ most of the time responsible for the administration of uh, antibiotic so we remind them to administer the antibiotic within 60 minutes before the skin incision and if there is two antibiotic uh, they can give uh, they can use two IV lines for administering the both antibiotic and also uh, we give the awareness to the surgeon and anesthetist and also anesthesia technician regarding the importance of administration and also for planned surgeries uh, that is uh, the ward nurse has to administer from the above ward in such cases there may be uh, if the surgery will be planned at uh, one o'clock and there will be some delay of uh, because of some uh, unexpected reasons so in that case the doctor will be putting the uh, order to administer the antibiotic uh, after 12, 12 o'clock but maybe he will not be available at that at that time then the surgery is already delayed uh, in that time what we do is we give the uh, privilege to the nurse uh, to change the administration time in the system so the nurse can uh, easily change the t uh, time of administration only for the preoperative antibiotic and they can uh, uh, actually comply with our guideline And uh, for our third KPI, which is uh, appropriate duration of uh, preoperative antibiotic, uh, if there is any decrease in adherence to the duration, uh, what we do is uh, we give uh, we made some automatic order like uh, as a pre prophylactic order as once once only. Uh, so after administering the order, the system will automatically cancel the order from the patient profile. So there is no uh, like the physician will not be forgetting to discontinue the antibiotic. The system itself will discontinue. And also, uh, if the physician continuing the antibiotic after 24 hours also, uh, the clinical pharmacist will review the case and if there is no necessity of giving this antibiotic, we will give a feedback to the physician and uh, together we take a decision regarding stopping the antibiotic. 
so let let, uh, let me tell you what are the lesson learned after implementing the guideline in a hospital uh, this now almost uh, one year now we we implemented this guideline in a hospital and uh, uh, we found that implementation of this cpg guideline uh, for surgical prophylaxis minimize the variation in patient care and enhance the patient safety and also appropriate build of prophylactic antibiotic order in the system help decrease the uh, ordering errors medication ordering errors and also we found that there are challenges we faced during uh, implementing this guideline initially we face uh, lack of cooperation from the physician uh, so we have to take uh, training sessions to the physician and nurses all uh, all the health care providers should be aware this because this is a new new uh, new policy and procedures we are implementing uh, so all the health care provider, providers has to be uh, they should be informed about it and they should be aware and uh, uh, while uh, implementing this guideline if there is any deviation uh, from any department or a, from any uh, special doctor or from any uh, special uh, nurse or any, any deviation we will focus that case and we will uh, we will personally we will contact and uh, we will give a, like uh, we will explain them what are the importance of the uh, our cpg guideline and also we will provide email feedback to the physician so talking directly or personally uh, informing them that helps uh, to build a good relationship with the physician uh, and also uh, ultimately it helps to helps to improve the uh, stewardship and uh, usage of antimicrobial in our hospital now we can discuss what are the clinical pharmacy specific interventions that we are doing in a hospital and uh, the first one is like we will recommend IV to oral therapy if whenever appropriate we will recommend the physician to change from IV to oral uh, for an example if the patient is tolerating uh, nasogastric feed like NG feed uh, then uh, the antibiotic for example linozolid if the patient is already on uh, IV linozolid and uh, he is tolerating NG feed and uh, yeah, we know that uh, Linozole is having almost 100 percentage oral bioavailability. So in that case, we will recommend the physician uh, to change from IV to oral. Also, we uh, assist the physician to make a dose adjustment based on the renal function, hepatic function, also for pediatric population, also patient, based on the patient body surface area, body weight, and also for any specific patient, we will help the physician to make the dose adjustment. Also, uh, we will optimize the antibiotic dose based on uh, like trough level or random level therapeutic drug level monitoring we are we are doing uh, that is only we are doing for mainly vancomycin and amino glycosid including gentamicin and uh, amikacin uh, and also there is uh, cases that is having highly resistant organisms uh, xdr organisms or extensively drug resistance uh, bacteria or sometimes even pan uh, total all the antibiotic will be resistant in some cases all these cases uh, we will uh, we will go through the uh, updated literatures and guidelines and we will help the physician by providing proper uh, genuine information regarding the management of these kind of cases also we will uh, give information regarding the cns penetration of antibiotic and the choice of any anti antibiotic based on the site of infection uh, for an example uh, what i can say tg cyclin tg cyclin if one patient is prescribed with tg cyclin for uti in that case as a clinical pharmacist uh, we will we have to definitely inform the doctor that that is uh, tg cyclin is uh, is not a good choice for uh, urinary tract infection if there is any uh, some other antibiotics are available as a choice of treatment same times tg cyclin is a good choice for skin uh, skin structure infection and also we will uh, involve in the administration part uh, like uh, time dependent antibiotics such as beta lactams carbapenems all these uh, time dependent antibiotics we will uh, we, we provide the nurse information regarding how to give along three, uh, how, what is the importance of giving the uh, time dependent antibiotic over 3 hours all these things also we will tell the doctor also uh, to put the order information uh, to administer the medication over prolonged infusion also we will check uh, the drug drug interactions and uh, drug food interaction for uh, each uh, uh, patient profile and we will uh, get back to the physician if there is any uh, significant interaction found 
also as a clinical pharmacist uh, we do the pros prospective audit and uh, give the feedback for the physician uh, mainly for uh, all the inpatient orders or and of antibiotics and all other medications also in all, most of the departments major departments and also we will review the positive cultures culture sensitivity report and we will analyze it and we will give clinical pharmacist uh, feedback to the physician and now we are mainly focusing uh, major departments such as ICU and we will uh, uh, together work with the clinician and uh, daily clinical rounds we will attend and we will provide the clinical uh, recommendations. Again, if we are uh, talking about the antibiotic stewardship part, uh, apart from the main major three KPIs, uh, that is for surgical prophylaxis, ad uh, selection, administration, and duration, we have some uh, four other KPIs also. That is, uh, the fourth one is uh, monitoring of the culture and sensitivity. Uh, the next one is uh, use of uh, observed antibiotics in our hospital and also the next one is the rate of Clostridium difficile infection and the last one is the co cost of antibiotic each month and uh, we have the data of all the month uh, of all these KPIs and uh, based on these data we can analyze we can uh, analyze and understand where we have to improve where we have uh, weakness uh, where is the problems we will identify the problems and we will correct it the stewardship committee will uh, conduct the meeting uh, and if there is any any important things we have to improve in our practice uh, the stewardship committee will uh, discuss together and uh, we will make a final decision action plan and uh, we will implement it uh, we will make the changes in our practice to prevent the deviation from the guideline and uh, it is like that the things will go like that here we have a list of observed antibiotic uh, usually most of the hospital is having list of restricted antibiotic and like that we have a observed antibiotic list uh, the thing is that we are not planning we, our plan is not to catch the physician hand or not to, to restrict the physician from ordering something uh, the thing is that uh, better to uh, let the physician order based on the clinical clinical condition of the patient and uh, as a clinical pharmacist, we can observe uh, along the with the physician. Same times we can observe, uh, we can give feedback uh, whether the cho choice of antibiotic and uh, when to stop, uh, when to change from IV to oral, and uh, when to escalate, when to de-escalate. Uh, all these things we can observe. So we made a, a list of observed antibiotic uh, that is based on the spectrum of activity and the safety of the antibiotic, also the prevalence of resistance. And also we consider the cost. It contains meropenem, imipenem, tazosin, uh, and also ceftazidim, avibactam, ceftolazone, tazobactam, ceftrolin, colistin, uh, antifungals such as caspofungin, enrilafungin, amphotericin, all these antibiotics we included in the observed list of antibiotics, not in the restricted list. So we will give, uh, as a clinical pharmacist, uh, we will give priority while auditing each patient case, we will give priority for this antibiotic and uh, we will give uh, prospective feedback to the physician. So that's all for now and uh, I hope you have got an idea how we implemented uh, this antibiotic stewardship in our hospital and what are the parameters we are monitoring, how we are improving our practice uh, by auditing, prospective auditing and feedback. So finally, uh, here I am mentioning what are the references uh, we used uh, while preparing the guideline. Uh, you can uh, go through the links to get uh, to have a further reading about this uh, topic uh, if you are interested you can go through it so finally i am concluding my talk uh, if you have any doubt or if you need any further clarification about my talk uh, you can contact me you can feel free to contact me no problem uh, i have provided my email id my contact number in the second slide i think god bless you all